Hello and welcome to this most recent episode of the Real Film Podcast. Uh, my name is Phil. I'm here with Corey. Hello. <laughs> uh, and today we're going to be talking about Christmas films. Um, we're recording this uh, in December, middle of December. So I think um, the best place to start is sort of what makes up a Christmas film, whether that's like good or bad, but what makes... A Christmas film. So I think we're both in agreement that just because a film is set at Christmas, it doesn't make it a Christmas film. So Die Hard, uh, Batman Returns, Kiss, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, these sorts of films, they aren't Christmas films, they're just films set at Christmas. So Corey, what for you do you think makes a Christmas film? Um, I think Christmas films are special in their own way because uh, there's only one time of year you can watch them. I think that that's the important thing for me. And I know it may not cover all Christmas films, but I've made the mistake in the past of watching It's a Wonderful Life and stuff in July. <laughs> and <laughs> it just doesn't feel the same. Um, so I think films that have that strange ability to change your mood around this time uh, are what I would consider Christmas films. Films that are always about you know, something leading up to Christmas Day, you know, very basic themes, but, you know, they work because of the time you're watching them in, basically. Yeah, for sure. And then there's also, there's always a sort of, almost always an element of sort of coming together and um, sort of uh, the themes of giving and loving and stuff like that. There's very few Christmas films that don't end on a note of... Um, sort of charitable giving and loving those around you almost always family whether or not it's your blood family or your friend family or anything like that there's always sort of themes of coming together as well i think christmas film is quite interesting as well because it's pretty much the only holiday that makes um a substantial amount of films and actually has good ones as well when you think about other holidays out there they don't often actually have that many films and if you do the Sometimes, no, usually they're a bit rubbish. Um, I think the only other holiday that you potentially could get out of that is Halloween films. But even then, they're more or less usually just horror films and you could pretty much watch them any time of the year. It's not as important. Like, like you say with Christmas films, with a lot of the films we're going to talk about, it would be weird to watch them uh, in July. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but there's plenty of Halloween films when you're in the mood for a horror film, you could just watch that instead. I feel like people watch like any horror movie because it's Halloween, you know, and mm. like it doesn't have to be set on Halloween night for you to enjoy it because it's Halloween. Whereas mm. Christmas is a very specific type of film you're going to watch. And I think you get more benefit from it, you know, having snow, even, you know, having Santa and all that, that kind of like childlike wonder. And like you said, the themes about, you know, coming together, whether it be community or family or even romantic, you know, uh, it's a very specific type of film. And Absolutely. Although Absolutely. I do, I do find it sort of uh, films like to ride on the, that commercial idea of Christmas more than anything, they still do have their place, I think. Absolutely. So on that note, then, what do you think are sort of uh, the most quintessential Christmas films for you? So I'd like wh whoever you ask, the films they always go to at Christmas will be different. Everyone has the different films. So what ones would you normally go to? And is there a reason why you would normally go to them? I think it's split between ones that are just forced down your throat to the point where you will have watched them at least <laughs> once. Um and some that I actively seek out around this time of year, like the ones that I, it makes it sound terrible as though I don't enjoy watching them, but like Home Alone 1 and 2, um, Elf, um, those three especially are just all over TV every yeah. Christmas. And I don't think I can escape a Christmas without watching it, but I, I don't care really. You know, I, I like all three in a you know, silly way, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Um, Elf is one of mine. Elf is one that even if I don't, if it doesn't miraculously doesn't just appear somewhere because it always just seems to be everywhere. It's one that I will seek out. I think Elf is pretty effortlessly 
fun. I think um, I'm a big fan of Will Ferrell as a comedic leading man. I think recently he's really dropped off with his quality. I think what was the most recent one? Holmes and Watson. Um, yeah. Which was atrocious. It was garbage. Just I think just because you have Will Ferrell being goofy and um, improvising, it doesn't mean that it's going to make a good film. So Elf was 2003, so this is pretty much before he was the big comedic leading man that he's known as now. I feel like at the time people wouldn't have expected him to, to be able to carry the film this well. So I feel like he you know, was firing on all thrusters to make sure that he showed people he could be this big guy and, you know, bring in the big money and, you know, make a good film. Whereas I think now he's sort of, I think he, I don't know, I don't know whether or not he thinks he can just coast along um, or whether or not he, he's putting it all in. But I, I do think he's dropped off a little bit. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Home Alone is one to go to as well. I actually watched Home Alone. I haven't watched Home Alone for a couple of years now. I watched it this year. Do you know what? It's not quite as fun as I remember it being. There's a little bit too much fluff before you get to the home aloning. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, I was, I, I was sat, that, yeah. I was sat there for a while thinking, okay, when does he get to the bit where he set up all these traps and he's actually fighting? You know, he's, he's fighting against um, these burglars. It takes an hour and fifteen minutes, and the film's like one forty. Um, I get, I get that you can't have like a ton of that stuff because it would probably get a bit exhausting. But I don't know. I just, I rewatching it. I hadn't seen it for a little while, and I came back into it. And I was like, ah, oh, it's not quite as fun as I remember. But you literally, as soon as that stuff kicks in, it's just so much fun. It's so funny. It's so inventive. Um, I yeah. um, I think actually, <clears throat> I think just because it's become so ingrained into me is that I do enjoy the whole thing. I know, you know, I, I, I've never been a massive fan of putting movies on just for the sake of putting movies on, like in the background. I just mm. don't agree with that. Um, but on this one occasion, you can do that with Home Alone. I think maybe just because I've seen it so many times. Um, and, you know, controversial opinion, I actually prefer the second one. The first <laughs> one. Yeah, that's pretty controversial. I can't agree with you. <laughs> I don't think I don't think the second Home Alone is is good uh, at all. But the amount of the amount of hate that's going to rain down on me now. Maybe I don't know. You're entitled to your opinion, even when it's wrong. Do you know what? I stand by it. You know, yeah, by no, that's death fine. threats. You know, on Christmas Day, I can take it. I, stand I don't think by anyone's going to send opinion. you. I don't think anyone's going to send you death threats because you said the I'm second Home Alone's better. I'm telling them. <laughs> To send them. You're gonna have it. You're gonna have all the MAGA people supporting you because Trump's in it for about three seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason I like it. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell you, I tell you, I've got two more films that I always jump to, and then I've got a third one which almost always comes up. So the two films that always I watch every year without fail is Love Actually, uh, yeah. which is a, one of those films I do think. It's better if you watch it at Christmas, but you don't actually have to watch it at Christmas. It would I imagine I imagine it'd be a bit weird to not watch it at Christmas, but because there's um for those who haven't seen it, if you haven't seen Love Actually, what are you doing? But for those of you who <laughs> haven't seen it, it's almost like um uh I don't know what the best way to do it. It's just like a load of intersecting stories around Christmas of people just sort of um Different aspects of love, I think, is the best way of describing it. You've got a um, couple who've been together for years whose marriage starts to fall apart. You've got fresh love with an English guy going to the States and um, a writer. Does he is he go to the, does he go to France to finish his book? Same. I think it's. Spain, somewhere, it's Europeans, Europe somewhere, mainland Europe somewhere, and he's got this sort of housemaid to sort of help him and look after him, and she doesn't speak a word of English, but they fall in love, and there's all these different um, relationships, and I think uh, I think it's so wonderfully written, like it's so, I mean, there's what eight or nine stories, I think, and at no point. Do I ever, when watching it, do I ever feel like we're spending too much time with one person? I feel like every story is balanced really, really well. And there's some genuinely, like, superb moments in it. So a bit of a spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen it, the bit where um, Emma Thompson gets 
the CD instead of the necklace from Alan Rickman yeah. is genuinely like an excellent moment where she has to sort of take herself away and she goes into the bedroom and she sort of has a little cry listening to the song and the music and then and then they leave it's such it's such a wonderful performance by her um a real moment in like in a film that's really really sweet and lovely and everything like that it's genuinely a fantastic um sort of moment of um uh, almost like bringing you down to earth that not everything is perfect i think uh love actually is just the quintessential uh, british christmas film isn't it yeah um because it's just a who's who of national treasures <laughs> people in england absolutely adore i don't mm. actually know um how well this movie did uh like abroad in the us and stuff like that but i mean it's just so british that i think <laughs> if you ask any english person they're going to say love actually is the top of their list to watch every christmas and uh like you said so many uh, superb moments and some great performances from some of the best uh, English actors out there just having fun basically yeah and it's yeah. really nice to watch it it's it did well in the box office it got 248 million dollars so you know it's a bit it, I mean me yeah <laughs> I just rattle off it. so Muppet Christmas Carol was also another big one for me. I love going to watch the Muppets Christmas Carol. Um it always have a so always has like a soft place in my heart. Um my controversial opinion is that this is the best version of like best adaptation of Dickens's book. Uh, right. I don't think there's another one that actually is. I think there are other good versions, but I think not only does it adapt the story in a way that, um, you know, is just pretty faithful to the book itself, but it has an element of having um, Gonzo pretending to be Dickens and then, um, you know, following us throughout and narrating little bits. The moments that he has are so, so funny. There's, there's loads of little moments of meta humour as well, which if you're a kid, you could just, like, I think it's written in a way that you could just enjoy it if you're a kid. But if you're an adult, there's this extra level there for you where you have, like, this in, on, omnipotent um, narrator who knows what's going to happen before it's going to happen. Um, I think it's so funny. So the film came out in 1992, which I think you have uh, Michael Caine playing the Scrooge in this one, which I think, by the way, is a really, really great performance from him because he plays it so straight. It's not like um, uh, something like Scrooge where you have something like a way of trying to sort of take a unique spin on it. You have this very, very straight Scrooge character, but playing against Muppets all the way through, I think is such a brilliant way of doing it. And they hardly changed any of the dialogue between him and the three ghosts that, that visit him. Yeah, I think I think it's a really, really fantastic film. Um, do you disagree with my statement that this is the best adaptation of A Christmas Carol? Well, um, I actually, to go back to one of my first points, was that you know I have the ones that are forced down my throat and I have the ones that I seek out. And Scrooged with Bill Murray is one mm. of the ones I actually seek out because I think it's just sort of Bill Murray and in his peak, basically, if he ever peaked. I don't even know <laughs> if he's, like, peaked yet. But, yeah, I think it's just... Um, I, I do love that film. But, yeah, I think uh, what I love about the Muppets one is that when... <laughs> I know it is obviously Dickens, but the way they tell it is almost as if, like... Uh, it's got that controlled chaos of the Muppets. <laughs> and um, it's almost as if they're just doing some, like, uh, improvised uh, reenactment of the story. And it, yeah. I love it. It just it works so well. And, it's... Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's really funny. I actually watched it the other day. And, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I'd say the two that I actively seek out are Scrooge and National Lampoon's uh, Christmas Vacation. Yes. Now, that's a, that's a hilarious film. Um, yeah. yeah, I think uh, I think National Lampoons have uh, a mixed history of you know success in their films, but I think everyone can agree that Christmas Vacation is the funniest one. Chevy Chase is like absolute fucking best as well. It's yeah, it, it is just a film to make you laugh, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Um, I I don't think I've seen like European Vacation. I've seen the first Vacation, which is pretty funny, also. But I just think. 
the Christmas one, the family and the themes just really fit the Christmas setting, don't they? So, and um, I think the stuff with the neighbours is really funny as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With, uh, I don't remember who plays the guy, but I think it's Julia Dreyfus, is it? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. Yeah, just the stuff like the just abuse that they find themselves getting. <laughs> the, uh, it's just so funny. My favourite moment is when he spends like all that time setting up all those lights and he's trying to plug them in and like they're not setting up at all. Like they're not turning on at all and he cannot figure it out. And then his wife in the garage is like, oh, this uh, this plug is unplugged. I'll best plug this in and does it. And it's just like this fucking like beacon that just completely <laughs> lights up the whole street. It's, just, it's so funny. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a yeah. great shout. It's a great shout. Uh, I'll throw in my last sort of film that I always end up watching. Um, now this one's going to seem a little bit strange. So I always end up watching how the Grinch stole Christmas, um, which is not a good film at all mm. it's rubbish but i can't help but love it <laughs> i think we've said in the past how there is a difference between you know what you consider to be the best film and what you consider to be your favorite films you know just because a film's your favorite doesn't actually necessarily mean it's good you know people would often refer to that as guilty pleasures i don't know I don't really agree with the statement. I don't think you have to be guilty about anything you like. And the Grinch, How the Grinch Stole Christmas is one of those for me. Um, it's weird. It's such a strange film. It has this sort of like, have you ever played the game um, We Happy Few? Where, so essentially I get this feeling uh, when I'm playing that game or watching the Grinch, I always feel like, you know, they're, they're sort of weirdly interconnected. Essentially what it is, is you're in this super happy uh, sort of candy filled beautiful place and everything everything's a bit overly happy everyone's a bit overly smiley because you're taking these drugs everyone's given this happy drug and you as the character decide to stop taking them and then the world becomes really grimy and disgusting and you know violent and I think there's some level to that of how the Grinch stole Christmas where everything's just a little bit too happy. Um, I think it is also uh, something comes from it as well. A lot of it is shot in like Dutch angles. It's, it's a lot of it is just really oddly shot. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like that's on purpose. I feel like what Ron Howard was trying to do is make some sort of comment on sort of um, commercialism and the spirit of Christmas being giving. But, you know, in the film, everyone's saying you've got to buy, buy, buy. The whole point is you buy presents. It's, it's only about the presents. It's not about sort of coming together and being generous and things like that. It's it's all about the money. Um, I just think I just think it's a very strange film. But I think Jim Carrey gives it his absolutely... Or it's Jim Carrey... At his most unhinged, probably. I mean, Ace Ventura comes close, but Jim Carrey in that late 90s, because this was 2000, so sort of mid to late 90s, Jim Carrey was just like doing things that no one else had ever done before. It was like this wildly animated, almost surreal level of sort of um, physical uh, comedy. And I think The Grinch is a prime example of that. I think it's got some... They're, as I say, it's not good, but some of the lines make me laugh so much. There's the bit about two thirds of the way in when he's deciding whether or not he's going to go to this ceremony that he's been given the award for. And he's like looking down the list and he's like, oh, well, my night's chocker, you know, 6 p.m. is self-loathing, 6.45, I'm having dinner with myself. Well, I can't push that again. And he's like listing off all of this stuff and he's like 7.30, staring into the abyss. And it's just, I don't know, I just think the way he performs it is so funny. Um, it's a weird film, but I can't help but love it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't agree with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you said Home Alone 2 is better than the first one, so your point's invalid. I Well, I think I prefer <laughs> yeah. it to the first one. But yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I don't, I just can't get on board with the, the film at all. Like, and don't, like, I love Jim Carrey. I think when he's at his wackiest, I, I honestly adore it. But um, I don't know. It's just, it's just really like weird and settling tone throughout the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unsettling's a good way of saying it. And uh, I just, I just don't think it's a very good film. It doesn't. If if we're judging it on what puts you in the Christmas spirit, that definitely doesn't put me in the Christmas spirit. I don't think the Grinch is ever going to put you in the Christmas spirit though, because the idea is you've got this character that hates Christmas. Obviously, by the end of it, he he falls back in love with it. Um, but I don't know. I feel like 
the main character of the film despises the holiday the whole time it's never really going to put you in the mood for it but um i well, mean we, we i don't know <laughs> i think we were just talking about what makes a good christmas movie and it's about all the people coming together and i also said it's about the setting and the snow and all the christmas and that is set at christmas and if you watch The Grinch, you don't agree with The Grinch, do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, no, see, so, that's, that's the thing. That's unless where you are it, a Grinch. That's why I think film. the film... <laughs> no, the reason why... That's why I think the film isn't good is it does muddle that a little bit because it shows you these flashbacks of him being, like, horribly bullied and mistreated when he was younger. So it's like, it makes him a sympathetic character because, you know, he wasn't a good-looking kid. He was different from everyone else and then he's just bullied um i get why you're doing that you have the the mayor's the bad guy and stuff but i don't know it's just i it, i think i think the the it works better as a children's book rather than a feature-length film um but i still can't help but love the film i think i i, I think i would despise the film if it wasn't for jim gary um what a weird entry by ron howard as well i think we've mentioned ron howard a few times before but the guy's got such a weird filmography <laughs> yeah he does did you ever watch the uh because i know they obviously animated the grinch yes the well let's i never actually watched that let's use that as a segue then to the next section so we were going to talk about um box office christmas films you know we don't often talk like people don't often bring out bring up like the the highest box office christmas films that grinch 2018 grinch is actually the highest grossing uh christmas film of all time wow 512 million dollars i have seen it i wouldn't say it's bad um by any stretch it's just fairly inoffensive and a bit bland um so it's made in the same style as horton here's a who um if you've seen that which i really like i think that's really fun but there's something i don't really know how to describe it i just i feel like in my mind i don't know whether or not this is true but in my mind they made horton here's a who it made loads of money which they potentially weren't expecting it to be you know as big of a success as it was and they kind of went all right well you know let's go make some other dr zeus animation like books uh, in animation form like this and they weren't like Horton Hizzer, who I feel like they were they were genuinely trying to make a really good film. And I feel like this one, they were just trying to cash in on on the same sort of success because it looks very, very similar. It's different directors, well, but it's very, very similar in, in sort of visual style. Well, every uh, Seuss animation I've watched, it looks exactly the same. And obviously, like I said, it's probably based on the Horton Hizzer who. Uh, like the Lorax is one as well. It just looks exactly... The same. Yeah. They obviously know how they want to animate their Dr. Seuss films. But I, no, I didn't get around to watching it just because I thought I don't like, I'm not a massive fan of the Grinch story anyway. Mm. I, it's not It's not a story that I hold dear to my heart and I don't really care. It's <laughs> not, it just To me, it just looked like a film that was going to be, just like you said, inoffensive and bland. And it just doesn't really interest me that much. But I mean, I was interested, the only thing I was interested in was about Benedict Cumberbatch voicing the Grinch. That is a strange one. Um, yeah, I think he's fine in it. He's, I think he he does. Uh, if you didn't know it was him, you might, might you probably wouldn't, you know, you know, hear it in his voice. The same thing as when he did Smaug in the Hobbit trilogy. If you didn't yeah. know that was Benedict Cumberbatch, you probably wouldn't know it was him. He has this way of sort of disguising his voice in a way. Whether or not that's through effects or him, I don't know. But this has the same thing, I think. Um, yeah, I think he's fine. It's nice to it's nice to hear him do a different role as well. I think some people go. Oh, he's that really good actor from Sherlock. He plays Sherlock really well. Um, but I think he's got a lot more range than that. I think, unsurprisingly, the second highest grossing film was Home Alone, 476 million. So it's not far behind it. But I mean, there's, what, 28 years between them? I imagine if you were to adjust it by inflation, Home Alone would have made a lot more. Um, but. I I don't really care about about adjusting things for inflation. Um, And then How the Grinch Stole Christmas, that was 345 million. Now, one film we haven't actually talked about yet was a 2009 Christmas Carol that Zemeckis did um, with... Jim Carrey, right? Yeah, it was Jim Carrey played Scrooge, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't like that film at all. I think Zemeckis had this really weird 
phase i mean i think he's still really in it but like so so the next film on the list has this problem as well um polar express where he yeah. makes these animations that i i think he he thinks the uh, the technology is further advanced than it actually is because there's always this weird deadness behind all the characters eyes there's just like this lifelessness in the characters it just there's there's no you know, there's no sense of like vividness in what we're watching at all. Polar Express is especially yeah. for that was 2004, but yeah, I think that's a, especially bad for it. But I, I'm not a fan of either of those things. I don't, need, I don't think either of them work well at all. Did he make uh, Beowulf as well? He did. Yeah. Um, was that, that was a, was that not a different style though? Wasn't it? I don't, I'm not sure. I can't really remember. I haven't watched it since I was younger, but. Um... I just remember that film, and I think Zemeckis did that as well, didn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Yeah, no, and I don't know. You know, Zemeckis has been a really, really great director in the past, but I feel like he's got to this point where he's trying to um, just make films for technology's sake, and the films are really, really suffering because of it. I don't think he's made a good film in a while now. So another one that's made a lot of money was The Holiday from 2006, 205 million dollars now you actually watched that for the first time this year didn't you i did what did you think <laughs> it was crap it is yeah <laughs> no that's harsh um i understand why people like it uh, i really do um i think kate winslet is great because she's always great uh jude law is the absolute pinnacle of the english gentleman so <laughs> that. i think i feel like jude law is the sort of uh what American women think English men are like. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is in the holiday, I think. Yeah. Um, no, I don't get me wrong. I understand why people like it. I just, I personally can't get on board with the, like all those themes and stuff we talked about with Christmas films. I think they just, it's just too much for me. It's just, it's a little bit overwhelming for me. And well, I, I think something that, um, we, you know, we touched on all these themes of, you know, coming together with family. And a lot of it, it just revolves around sentimentality. And I think we'll get into some of the more classic films in a minute. But something that um, I think we're both in agreement on is the classic films do the sentimentality and sweetness, like uh, almost like oversweet and over sentimental. They do it a lot better than newer films. And I mean, we could have a discussion around why we think they work and why they don't work. I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that um, these older films, you know, as I say, we'll get into them in a minute, but we're, we're going to be talking to stuff, stuff like White Christmas and It's a Wonderful Life and Miracle on 30, 34th Street and stuff like that. They're really, really sentimental, but they work because they feel like they, you know, these are made in a time where films weren't making extortionate, amount of money do you know what i mean you know these are all 40s and 50s they aren't making hundreds of millions of dollars yet so i feel like they were making a good natured film for the sake of making something that was sweet and good natured whereas i think stuff like the holiday and things like that when they come out they're making a good natured film because they know it will make money it's just an easy way to make money now um Stuff like uh, last year, like 2019's Last Christmas, um, I think it had some sort of originality to it, but I just feel like it was a pretty bland way of trying to cash in on, you know, this this oversweet, you know, seasonal money, essentially. I mean, Last Christmas made $121 million, which is insane, because that is, that is a rubbish film. Um do you sort of agree with that? Do you, do you think there's any other reasons why you think um, newer films don't aren't as successful when it comes to this? Uh... No, I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I mean, I watched recent, not recently, last year, I think I watched it, was that Netflix film, Let It Snow. Yeah. Uh, not, not great. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't great, and... It's for the same like reasons you were saying. It just feels just bland and a really bad attempt to uh, pander to the commercialization of Christmas. Whereas the old ones, they have the feeling that you know these themes, while they may be exploited, there's an element that they genuinely believe in them. Mm. Um, it, that's what old films feel like, especially It's a Wonderful Life, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's why they work. And I also think, you know, 
uh, all, like golden age Hollywood anyway, romance and stuff can come across very overly sweet, but it works anyway because it fits the style that they have. Mm. Before, let, I know we've spoken about classic films, but let's just cover a couple more films from the sort of money making more um, recent side. Um, all three of the Santa Claus films are in the top 20. Um, the lowest grossing one made $110 million, which was the Santa Claus 3. Now, I don't know about you, I don't actually like any of the Santa Claus films. I don't think they're funny at all. I think they are super generic and really bland, which I, yeah. I, I, I know a lot of people really like the first Santa Claus um, I know a lot of people really like Tim Allen, but I think this is Tim Allen, not necessarily at his worst, but like there's just no effort put into any of the jokes. It's just so lazy. I just I feel like I haven't actually seen the Santa Claus three because the second Santa Claus was so shit. That is a, it's so bad. It's so the first one I can excuse. The second one is crap. But yeah, no, I just I just think it's really really lazy writing. It's really lazy jokes. Yeah, no, I'm not a fan. I have seen the third one. Uh, oh dear. It's uh, it's worse than the second one. <laughs> <laughs> How um, is that possible? <laughs> I, it's very sad to see Martin Shaw in it. <laughs> A guy who's very funny and he's cast as Jack Frost, I think. And there's this whole thing about Jack Frost wanting to, uh, yeah. to take over as Santa Claus. And it's, um, yeah, it's pretty forgettable. It's pretty awful. Uh, I haven't watched it in years and I probably will never watch it again. Cause yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. No, I, I agree. Martin Shaw is really, um, he's a really, really funny guy. He's probably most known for the Saturday Night Live stuff. But I, I'm a huge fan of... Th- <laughs> I know The Three Amigos is probably not a very good film, but it's the one with uh, Montreal, uh Steve Martin and Chevy Chase. And I just think it's really funny. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it. The The poster is terrible. The one that's got like, it's, it's like um, Tim Allen on one side and then Martin Short on the other. Martin Short looked like, <laughs> like his Jack Frost looks rubbish. Um, yeah, I'm kind of glad I haven't seen it. <laughs> um <laughs> And then I've got another one I think is probably just worth mentioning because the money that it's made and a lot of people end up seeing it as Four Christmases. Have you seen Four Christmases, the 2008 one? Vince Vaughn, the Reese Witherspoon. Reese, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think maybe I've seen a bit of it when my sister's watched it, but I mm. haven't personally seen it, no. There's, there's not really much to say about it. I actually, again, it, it's a prime example of a film the a little bit like the holiday and all these other things we've been talking about that it's just cashing in on sentimentality it's pretty bland um the sort of idea that both of the like these two people are married and both of their parents have split up and so they have to go to you know the four different houses at christmas it's just it, it, it there's nothing original about it it's not funny no one's very good there at was it. um there was another Vince Vaughn Christmas movie. Is it like Fred Claus or something like that? Yes, Fred Claus is on there too. Um, I wasn't going to mention it, but that's rubbish too. <laughs> in my yeah, opinion. I just I, I just find it weird that he's been in two Christmas films. But I guess uh... and nearly back to back as well. Fred Claus is two thousand seven. Um, oh wow. But yeah, no, um, I wasn't going to mention that because that one actually didn't break even. That one had a budget of a hundred million and it and it made uh, just shy of ninety eight million. So, oh, right. oh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's not very good. No, I, I wasn't a fan at all. Um, so let's move on to the more positive side. And let's talk about the good stuff. So the good classic films. So uh, one that I love to jump to that we mentioned a bit already is it's a wonderful life. Um, it is. I think that's a quintessential Christmas film for a lot of people. I think that's the one that a lot of people will watch every year. Um, and again, I think it's a prime example of a film. It's easy. It is a. It is a Christmas film. There's no two ways about it. It's a Christmas film. But a large portion of the film isn't at Christmas because you spend so much of the time following our main character, you sort of understand his life until this point, until you reach you know, this point where he gets so down. Um, yeah, I think it's a great story. Um, I think it does something that a lot of Christmas films shy away from now, which is looking at the darker side of um, just general life, not necessarily not anything dark about Christmas, but 
you know, the darker side of life, um, where a guy is so down on the on, on his luck, you know, he thinks he's worth more dead to his family than he is alive. Um, and he's shown the sort of uh the impact he's had. Um and I think uh it to me I've always felt of it felt it it's kind of like a way to reimagine a Christmas carol, because it's the same sort of um you have this uh, supernatural being sort of show you another aspect of life to change an opinion that you're with. But I, it's so much more than that. Um, do you know, the only, I, the only criticism I think I ever have with it is that it spends about five minutes too long on him not understanding that he's when he gets, when he gets to the point where he's seeing his town and his life, if he wasn't born, uh, I think it probably spends about five minutes too long on him not understanding that he's in this point. But yeah. that is such a minor. That's not even really. It's not even really a complaint. It's just a personal thing that I'm like. It's probably just because I've seen it so many times now. I'm kind of just a bit like, yeah, cool. Now you, we all understand. We all know what's going on. But um, yeah, I think it's got such a lovely message. And we even I can't I can't tell you how many times I've seen it, and I well up every time when it gets to the end when everybody comes in with that bucket full of money to sort of help him out and get him out of it it's pretty much the pinnacle of you know how like how sweet a film can be it's just a, the neatest bow tied on the top you know, his brother coming back and everything like that but yeah i think so yeah i think it's a brilliant film yeah i think uh frank capra as a director is mm. is the prime example of uh almost that Christmas, like the very common themes among Christmas, uh, Frank Capra it, it uses them in a lot of different films. Um, not just It's a Wonderful Life, but I would argue that It's a Wonderful Life, and it's a Wonderful Life is like the quintessential Christmas film mm. because it's just, it's just so famous and it's just a prime example of the basic themes of a Christmas film used with uh, technique and just a lot of uh, talent involved. I mean, Jimmy Stewart is, you know, one of the greatest actors of all time that's ever lived. And it's yeah. just, I don't, I didn't well up maybe because no one's ever brought me a bucket of money and it just makes me even sadder. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I would probably agree with you as well that it maybe it does linger on that uh, misunderstanding or um, that he has but you know again it's a minor thing isn't it in yeah. a film that's just fantastic yeah i you know i think the only film you could potentially put in contention for you know the quintessential christmas film is white christmas um not least because of the song as well obviously like there's so much more to white christmas other than you know the the titular song um but i feel like that is one of the or maybe the most quintessential Christmas song uh, as well. It's one that will always be played. Um, and, yeah, I, I'm i a huge fan of White Christmas too. I actually have probably watched White Christmas more times than I have of It's, it's a Wonderful Life. I don't think it's quite as good as, as It's a Wonderful Life. So I think one of the reasons why it's um, a bit more watchable is because it doesn't hit quite as many dower notes as... It's Wonderful Life does, you know, so like I think the saddest moment in the whole film, it's not even sad, but it's when uh, Betty decides to move to New York because she thinks Bob and Phil are bringing in, you know, this whole TV thing and cashing in on the general's sort of um, uh, down and outness. But, you know, he, he goes to New York and then, uh, you know, um, Bob goes to New York and then he goes on the show and he, he tells everyone, you know, you know, he tells his old unit, you know, come, come and, you know, we'll make this a great Christmas for him. And she understands and then she comes back and as a, you know, a, a lot of these films have all these um, neatly tied bows at the end. I just think it's so, um, so f lovely and full of life and it's just vivid and it's, it's like prime uh, sort of golden age Hollywood as well with the sort of the snappy dialogue and um, you know the sort of classy girl, uh, guys and and you know you've got, you, you've got these beautiful dames who can sing and dance and everything like that it's all very very sort of classic Hollywood um, I just think it works brilliantly 
I know for some people it will be overly sweet, especially the sequence at the end when the general comes into the barn and, you know, or everything that goes on there. I think some people might find that a bit overly sentimental, a bit overly sweet. Um, but I think because it's Christmas, you do want to watch these happy films. I think that's one reason why, you know, when we talk about what makes a Christmas film, about everyone coming together and everything being really happy and having these neatly tied bows, you want that at Christmas because you want it to be a happy time of year. Um, and I think White Christmas really, really embodies that side of it well. Uh, yeah, I actually, I mean, it, it hits literally the two hour mark and I started, I did feel the runtime a little bit, but it, it fixes it with a very, like you said, it, it ties those uh, bows up very nicely at the end, and it's very nice. I know that uh, they made the film because of the success of the song that was made, um, that was sang by Bing Crosby in the Holiday Inn, which I originally thought was a Christmas film, but it's not. <laughs> it's just a film that spans a lot of holidays. Um, but, yeah, I think... The song is iconic and the movie very clearly has iconic moments in it. But my favourite scene in the whole thing, the thing that saved it from being a bit tiresome for me was the one with the bit with the uh, captain when he mm. walks in the room. Such a beautiful little moment. And then, I mean, how can you not enjoy a film that has so many just dances and song mm. numbers in it? Well, that's what I... Fit into a... Just fit into a, um, in a very golden age Hollywood musical way yeah well that's what I, that's what I was going to say as well is that obviously the, the White Christmas is the one that's remembered the most but I do think there's a lot of really great other numbers in it too um, yeah I just yeah I think it's all around a really uh, a really great classic film to go back to so I another one I mentioned as well Miracle on 34th Street the, I, I'm talking about the 1947 version here the 1994 with Richard Attenborough I'm not a huge fan of. I think it does it. It doesn't really touch on any new ground, and it's not as um, it doesn't do the the over sweetness as well because this is just about as sugary sweet as a film can get. This is uh, just about as family friendly as a film can get too. Have you seen the 1947 version? Yeah, I watched it a few weeks ago. Um, it's great, and to be honest, the uh, the one with uh, Richard Attenborough in it. I, I remember watching it when I was younger, and I think me and my sister enjoyed it when we were younger. But I do completely agree with you that there's no there's no real other than the setting and uh, like maybe some other aspects. There's no real uh, thing to suggest that they've made many changes to it. And the reason the first one works so well is, like you said, it does that over sweetness so well and. It's such a nice little film to watch uh, at Christmas, whereas this one just can't quite uh, help but be like almost oversweet to the point of sickly, I guess is a good way of describing it. Yeah, that, that, that's a good way of describing it, yeah. So I'll just talk about one last classic before we sort of move on. Um, it's not quite as good as, you know, the ones we've mentioned, but Shop Around the Corner, which was from 1940, um, it's much more of a comedy than the other ones are. Um, it's a really lovely little film, though, Um it, it sort of it it was the one that's remade, so people might more often know it as uh, "You've Got Mail" um, with Tom Hanks. But I do think that that's a much inferior version, partly because in "You've Got Mail," when they're writing to each other, Tom Hanks's character figures out who he's talking to before she does, and then there's this extended section where he's leading her on. And sort of becomes very stalkerish and sort of very controlling in her life and sort of interfering before she realizes at the end. Whereas in Shop Around the Corner, it's basically about like um, two people who work in the same shop who don't like each other at all in person, but they're writing letters to each other and falling in love with the person they're writing letters to because they're doing it anonymously. I think it's a really, really sweet film. Um, I, again, it's um, uh, Jim Stewart. 
I think he's great in it as well. You know, we mentioned how good he was earlier. He's really, really great. Um, yeah, I think it's worth checking out. It's a really lovely little film. Um, if you liked You've Got Mail, you'll probably think Shop Around the Corner's better because it's just, it's just well, maybe you don't. But it is a better version of, of the same story, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard of it. I haven't watched it, though, but I will. I, I mean, I love Jimmy Stewart, so I'll definitely get around to it. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about some of the ones that you know we've not already talked about. Ones we we love, some that we hate, because uh, <laughs> I feel like there could be a few of those. Um, one that I've always I wouldn't say it's like a quintessential one that I go to. I've just I've watched it and I enjoyed it. Was Bad Santa with yeah. Billy Bob Thornton? Um, you know, there's nothing particularly groundbreaking about it. It's just a very it pretty much coasts on the fact that Billy Bob Thornton is uh, just. <laughs> He just looks so exhausted through the whole thing and I think that's his whole character. But, um, you know, it's got a sweet ending and I feel like, again, it's not groundbreaking, but I've always just enjoyed that. And sometimes it's nice just as a, you know, a lot of uh, Christmas films can often be aimed at kids and Bad Santa's not, I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and I, sometimes it's nice to watch those kind of films, you know. Um Another one for me was uh, Jingle All the Way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I love this. I know, I, there's no reason why I can think as to why I still love it, <laughs> but I do. Um, maybe it's just that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he was, he, was, he was doing that thing where he was through, going through that stage where he was doing a lot of comedies and he weirdly is really good in comedies as well. He, there's something so strange about him. He just works well. Like Kindergarten Cops, another example of that, isn't it? That like they're yeah. not necessarily good films, but he's so good in them. Like he's so funny. Well, no, he's not. He's not acting well in them. He's he's not a good actor, but he sort of allows that to be part of the comedy. But yeah, I I love Jingle All the Way. I think it's really um inoffensive and easy watching um it's it's a bit different to your standard christmas film i think probably because you've got arnold schwarzenegger in it <laughs> um but yeah no i yeah i'm a big fan of that i i think that's one of those if you if you were to make a list of guilty pleasures air quotes i think that would be a really great addition to that yeah i mean in terms of other christmas movies i start to there's not many that are I'll latch on to. Uh, we've already mentioned most of them. I mean, Scrooge is another one that, again, I said uh, I, I love. Um, but there's a lot more, I think, that I dislike. <laughs> yes. I but, can. Uh, before we move on to that, can I just add in one that I don't understand? I've, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, it's a guilty pleasure. It's fun. It's not really good, but it's fun. No. Office Christmas Party is crap. It's not funny. Oh, yeah, it it's not entertaining. It's a load of bollocks. In my opinion, I don't, yeah, I don't, every time it comes to this time terrible. of year, people make an argument for it. Oh, it's easy watching. You know, you can turn your brain off to it. No, it's shit. It's not good. It's not good. Sorry. Little mini rant over. i really, really dislike that film. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I mean, I was going to say that one, that is one I didn't like. I mean, it's running off the fact that it's like high concept in the sense that it's meant to be like project X at Christmas, basically. Mm. But, uh, I think it coasts too much on the humor of TJ Miller, who I've never been massive on, if I'm honest, uh, yeah. he's good in certain things, but, uh, I've just never been a fan of his style of comedy really. And yeah, it's just not, it's, it's got a great crap, cast though. That's the problem. Yeah. It's got a great yeah, it cast. Does, yeah. It's got, um, I mean, Jason Bateman's sort of the lead character. And I think even when a film is crap around him, I think he's usually really good in it. Cause he is, I think probably the best working straight man in comedy. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head that would come close to his like level of straight man now. I think he he has a really good knack for being really, really funny in the straight man role, but not stealing the show from the actual sort of people who are making explicit jokes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, he's really good at being the straight voice in the story as well. Yeah. So he kind of keeps the story going while it allows people to make jokes around him. Yeah. Um. So he always feels like the lead character but yeah i think it just allows people to shine around him as well at the same time yeah i think he's underrated in in that role though um because if, if he didn't work in that in that role that i don't think the people would be as funny around him but just before we move on like you look at the cast you got olivia munn you say tj miller which i think tj miller can be funny uh 
in Silicon Valley. But <laughs> I think people just sort of essentially typecast him in that role. And I just, yeah, he has a couple of lines in it that are okay. But, you know, they've got Jennifer Anderson and Kate McKinnon. And oh, it's, there's just lots of people in it who I think are really good. Um, Rattle Park. I just, I, it's just crap. <laughs> it's just crap. Yeah, it's, it's a shame. Film, really. No, it's a shame. It's a shame. Um, uh, into, I mean, there's a lot that I just I do dislike, but uh, I think Office Christmas Party is one that stands out. There's other one. Most of the time, when I do watch a Christmas film, it's either it just feels bland, like we talked about at the start with uh, modern Christmas films being well aware of what they're doing, uh, having the, trying to uh, just create a really baked Christmas film that they know can pander. Mm. to a lot of people around this time and i just find them all really bland um yeah. another one actually that i did enjoy i will admit was christmas chronicle and i know <laughs> the second one is on netflix uh but i haven't watched that uh but the first one i enjoyed just because kurt russell was santa claus yeah i think that's really good well one one that i think plays against the sort of type that you imagine of these generic sort of uh bland christmas films is krampus not necessarily a good film, but I will give it, you know, uh, props for trying to do something different. Um, it's really weird because it, it's like a B movie, but it's like a holiday film, and it's really gory. I don't know. It. I think. I think it has moments in it that are really fun. It's got some really good people in it: Adam Scott and Tony Collette and people like that. Um, I think if you were looking for a Christmas film and you like horror, that's a. Good, I think it it does appeal to a certain audience. Well, the final one that again I'm probably gonna. This is just my personal opinion, uh, and it's maybe it's based on when I watched it and stuff. I'm not a massive fan of a, a Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, I heard and this. <laughs> whether or not you know, um, you know, whenever you watch it, I mean, I'm sure you can watch it on Halloween as well, but it's a Christmas film, really. Um, yeah, I think. I think for me it's because of anticipation is the reason I'm not a massive fan. I love the animation. I think it's great. But um, it was sold to me as – this is before I started watching a lot of movies or anything. Uh, it was sold to me as one of the best movies they'd ever seen. So when I watched it, thinking that I was about to watch one of the best movies I've ever seen, <laughs> I didn't like it. And I thought I rewatched it about a year ago, I think, uh, obviously with a bit more of a clearer head of what to expect. And I, just, I don't know, I just, it just wasn't for me. I just couldn't get into it, really. There's not a specific thing I disliked about it. And uh, I actually think a lot of it is good. I just, I don't know, it's just not for me. It's not something I'll ever think to put on around this time of year. Yeah, I do have to say I disagree. Um, I think it's a really, really great film. Um, it's obviously got the sort of uh, uh, like full-on grip of Tim Burton in it. He didn't direct it, but you know Tim Burton is heavily involved in it. Um, I think it. I think it's just about as original as a Christmas film can get. Um, I mean, you said that you could watch it at Halloween. And, you know, not bat an eye. And I think when you've got two holidays that are so different in Christmas and Halloween in, like, visual aesthetic and you can still potentially watch a Christmas film at Halloween, I think that says a lot about, you know, um, what it's trying to do. It sort of um, almost reinvents what a Christmas film potentially can be. Um, I think it's beautifully animated. I love the stop motion. You know, Tim Burton goes on to do his own stuff, like Corpse's Bride and Franken Weenie, which I don't think hit the same sort of levels. Um, but I think it's really, really great. I, I don't agree with your friend. It's not the best film ever made or one of the best films ever made, but I do think it's really great. Um, and it's a shame that you had that going into it because it was never going to reach that you know, level. Well, like I said, I, I mean, I gave it another chance and I, I did enjoy it, uh, but like not as much again as I thought what I would. Yeah. Um, maybe it's just uh, my own personal thing. Maybe I've just basically been uh, my, the anticipation from the first time is kind of uh, tainted every time I'm going to watch it now because I'm just going to have that feeling in the back of my head. Maybe. Um, but like, you know, like I said, th this is not like, that was just my opinion, you know, it's, yeah. it's just the effect it has on me. I mean, like I said, I love the animation so much. I think it is great. And I love to Corpse Bride as well. Um, so I have no reason not to like it. Maybe I'll give it another chance because I really want to like it. I do really want to like it. 
Um, it's just the two times I've watched it, it's just not really had that effect on me, really. So I think the last film um, I was going to talk about is actually one that I only watched for the first time like a week ago was uh, Klaus, the 2019 uh, animation, which I haven't actually looked this up. Maybe I should have done it beforehand, but it's probably one of the only Oscar nominated films on this list. It was nominated for uh, feature length animation. Um, And if you would say nothing else about it, the animation is stunning you know we just talked about nightmare before christmas but i i always have an affinity for hand-drawn animation i love hand-drawn animation but this isn't disney hand-drawn animation there's something about this that is just so different and so fresh and so unique um i love the way it looks it's a really original in the way it tells its story as well it's not your typical christmas story it's about a postman going to a remote island you know to try and get you know the post going there a little bit more um yeah i think it's really really great jason Schwartzman plays the, the postman i think he's really funny jk simmons plays klaus um i think he's really great in it he's so funny and he's so great um he's so sweet and kind-hearted and you know uh, a unique way to sort of envision how the giving of gifts on christmas comes about it's not about where christmas comes from christmas as a concept exists and as a day exists but the idea of the giving of gifts and giving of toys um it comes from that i think it's really really sweet um yeah, and I think there's a lot of depth to it. I think it has a lot to say, um, which I, I think a lot of newer Christmas films don't. I was really, really surprised by it, and I really, really enjoyed it. I watched it last year, I think, when it came out on Netflix, because I knew it was nominated for the Oscar. And, uh, yeah, it's such a gorgeous film. Um, and I know, like, you're right, it, it is a very fresh way to tell that kind of story. And uh, it just it's just so enjoyable from beginning to end, and you just even when there's quiet moments in the film, it's just greeted by these absolutely beautiful backdrops. Uh, And it's so consistent as well with this, uh, with how beautiful they are. Uh, Genuinely one of the, one of the better Christmas films to come out in the past few years. Definitely. Uh, It doesn't feel like it's pandering at all as well. I think it just wants to tell a really great story with a really beautiful animation. And I think that's really important. And it's something that's been missing uh, in modern Christmas films, really. I think that pretty much uh, sums it up and uh, brings us to the conclusion of this uh, episode. Uh, Thanks for listening. And if you disagree with uh, anything, I can imagine I've said some controversial stuff in this podcast. So if you disagree, uh, let us know. Uh, If we've missed any of your favourites, please tell us, because, you know, we're always looking for ways to be festive. Um, You can uh, follow us on Twitter at Real Reviewing, and it's the same on Instagram. Um, Be sure to listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and uh, it'll also be on YouTube for you. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at CospJord and Phil. Uh, at Philson Wilson. Philson Wilson. Uh, yeah, so uh, catch you next time.